Hey guys, this is Jeff Stanick with Figured Out Baseball. We've got a really good Figured Out Baseball podcast today, and uh, I've been trying to bring on some guests recently that have a, a bit of a different background or different perspective or, or different educational backgrounds to offer some different things other than just on-field coaches. I know all of our subscribers love to hear from the on-field coaches at different levels and um, you know various people from different, different parts of the country, but today we've got a different guest on who I'm very, very excited to hear from. We're being joined by Ryan Croton today, uh, and I think once you hear Ryan's background, you're going to be as excited about this podcast as I am. I'll start all the way back from when he was getting his doctorate. From September 2006 through 2013, he was in the doctoral program at the University of Buffalo in the areas of uh, biomechanics and exercise physiology. Uh, that's within their exercise and nutrition sciences department. Uh, so spent a long time there getting his doctorate and did a lot of other things while he was getting his doctorate, one of which was during the springs of 2007 and 08, he was the volunteer baseball coach at Buffalo as well as the team's strength and conditioning coach. Also during the time he was getting his doctorate, he spent uh, the 2008 and 9 seasons as the strength and conditioning coach for the short season team uh, in the St. Louis Cardinals organization. Then in February 2012 through November 2014, he was the major league assistant strength and conditioning coach, as well as the roving, as well as a roving coordinator with the Baltimore Orioles. And again, part of that time while he was with the Orioles, he was still finishing the doctor. Pretty amazing. He was able to balance all of that stuff. Then from June 2015 through December of 16, uh, he was a postdoctoral researcher on human performance, as well as the throwing clinic coordinator at the University of Pennsylvania. That in itself might be worth jumping into and just kind of asking some questions about. And now you're hopefully starting to see uh, why I'm so excited to have Ryan on as a guest, you know, being that way back in 2015, 16, he was the throwing clinic coordinator at Penn. Then from January 2017 through October 2018, he was the player performance coordinator for the Los Angeles Angels, overseeing minor league strength and conditioning programming throughout the organization. Then he was promoted in November 2018, and he stayed until January of 2021 with the Angels as their director of performance integration. At, during In this position, he oversaw the strength and conditioning department, also oversaw the monitoring and training of athletes, the integration of technology in their training, as well as identifying biomechanical differences between major leaguers and minor leaguers and much more. You know, those are things I'd love to touch on. He is currently, in addition to his, to his current job, he's also a research associate at Louisiana Tech, as well as Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand. Um, his current job he took in June of 2021. That's when he became the vice president of armcare.com a company that's focused on individualized assessment and training for competitive overhand athletes, athletes like pitchers, like position players that where their, their arm is above their head, uh, you know, they're, they're throwing athletes. The arm, care, the arm care platform offers data-led monitoring and individualized training for throwing athletes. Uh, an associate company of armcare.com is Crossover Symmetry, who is a sponsor of Figured Out Baseball, uh, you know, for all these reasons, Ryan Croton, we're definitely very, very pleased to have you on the podcast today. And I just want to personally thank you for taking the time to be here. Oh, I really appreciate it. I'm excited to uh, be able to shed some insight in terms of uh, the, the state of arm care and, and what it means in terms of preventing injury in baseball and, uh, you know, how important it is to individualize our programming in uh, preparing ourselves for competition. And those are things that I think every, you know, baseball coaches and players at almost every age, they they probably hear some things like that and and uh, are aware of you know individualized programs. They're aware of the the state of arm injuries and and how often injuries are occurring. And, and I certainly want to talk about everything with you. I know we have a limited amount of time. We could probably spend three hours on a podcast with all the stuff sure. that, that you know and your background and just everything you've done and, and your place in the baseball world. Um, I'm not sure where the best place is to start, but I would like to ask you, um, what was it about your background 
that got you to where you are? You know, what, what part of your background got you interested enough and, uh, I, I guess, caring enough about arm care to, to take on a job like the VP of arm com as opposed to staying in a pro baseball organization in some regards, or, um, you know, working within a university, uh, like you did at Penn or, or whatever it may be, you know, what, what about your background, Ryan, and, and your, uh, your affiliation with baseball got you to where you are today as the VP of armcare.com. What led you here? Yeah. So it actually all started from when I was 11 years old and, uh, I was a pretty big kid that could throw very, very hard. Um, I think I got clocked at, at, at 11 years old around 75 or 77 miles an hour. I can't remember, but, uh, I was pitched all the time. You know, and that generally happens when you're a young athlete, your, your coaches want to win and you utilize your best arm. And, and I was throwing all the time and, um, my arm, my elbow started to become red and hot after one of my outings. And I remember I complained to my mom and, you know, she said, give it some rest. And every time I pick up the ball and throw, I'd have pain. So eventually I ended up going to see a physician. And the physician t- took a look at my elbow and he said, you know, you have some, a pretty significant case of little leaguer's elbow. And if you continue to pitch, there's a good chance that you're going to have a fracture, an avulsion fracture of your arm. And for people on this, listening to this podcast, an avulsion fracture means that uh, the piece of the bone that the ligament and the tendon is, uh, is attached to actually rips off. There's a hairline fracture in the growth plate and it actually rips off from repetitive throwing. So um, from that age, it's always kind of been in my mind. It's like, you know, why did this happen to me? Um, and what can I do to prevent this from, from this happening to other athletes? And uh, throughout my education, I had thought I was going to be a medical doctor. That's, that was going to be my pathway. And that's what my family wanted me to do is, you know, become an orthopedic medical doctor. And I, I had an interest in pediatric orthopedics and helping young athletes through injuries um, but as I, as I started to get more interested in training, um, cause I also played baseball, um, for quite a while, I played at the independent league level as well. So I, I got interested in training. I thought, you know what? I don't want to be a doctor. I, I want to be a doctor in some form of sports science. And so it led me to the university of Buffalo who, which when I entered the uh, university, there were so many opportunities to not only coach, um, I was able to coach based on my background, but they had a biomechanics lab where we, we really remodeled it so that I could pitch. And I started looking at the mechanisms of changing the kinematic sequence, which is your order of movement, uh, as well as the loading on the arm through a change in stride length because I felt if something happened in the lower body, there could be an emphasis on having stress the throwing arm. And I recently published a paper, it's going to be out soon, that looked at grip strength changes with changes in stride length. And what I found is when athletes reduce their stride, they actually had a reduction in grip strength. And our, our muscles that um, promote grip strength are the ones that protect the uh, UCL from injury. So all of that tied into now, you know, this particular job of utilizing my education, my baseball experience, and, and obviously what happened to me as an 11 year old to, uh, to fight uh, the fight in, uh, in terms of injury and, and advanced performance and throwing athletes. Wow. Um, we could probably spend a lot of our podcast talking about what you just said with grip strength and stride length. Um, that's very, very interesting. Uh, where, do you mind me asking where that's going to be published so people that are interested in reading that, where they might find it? Yeah, yeah. So it just, it's just been accepted, and it's going to be in the International Journal of Sports Physical Therapy, and that should be coming out in the next three to four months. It usually takes a little bit because they got to do the copy editing and just ensure everything's right. But it, it really sets the stage for our company and our cares you know, strength matters most. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's just not enough information on arm specific strength. You know, it makes more, it makes a lot of sense in terms of traditional strength and conditioning and, you know, max effort lifting and absolute strength and even relative strength, you know, which is the strength relative to your body weight that you can achieve in, in 
you know, compound lifts, like the squat, the deadlift, and the bench press, but little else is known about what it means to the throwing arm. And so, you know, that's, that's the mission with, with armchair.com that I'm with is we're starting to create a new language for coaches because the coaches, the, the actual skill coaches, they're the ones that are really feeling responsible for throwing athletes, uh, their health. And so we need to arm them with not only the tools to be able to individualize training and to be able to assess their athletes, but we also have to give them the parameters of monitoring. And so that's really on the, the new frontier of, you know, sports performance in a sport like baseball. Pitching coaches, I think, have a very difficult job today. And, and as a, when I was a college coach, I was uh, on the hitting side of things, as people know that listen to this. I always thought that that was one of the most difficult things uh, that a pitching coach had to do was to monitor, you know, sometimes 18 guys or however many pitchers, 20 guys are on a, you know, are on a college coach, uh, college pitching staff and trying to keep them all healthy and trying to, you know, individualize things for everyone. Um, I, I want to talk to you, Ryan, a lot. I'd like to spend a lot of the, the, the time we have on this podcast talking about the state of arm care um, and, and overuse injuries and just and things that you see and ways that people can, you know, help themselves. If there are parents listening to this or players or, you know, even coaches at any level, just, uh, you know, how to how to to do their best to keep players healthy and on the field. And, um, you know, for that, I'd like to just kind of ask you what you think are maybe some of the the basics of it, uh, of of the state of arm care and where we are today uh, with with technology and with what you know from your side of things. Can I just ask you if there are like one or two things that you think are maybe some of the most important things and maybe that maybe you'll just tell me there aren't one or two things, but but a couple things that you think are some of the most important things to keeping young players and we'll say maybe specifically pitchers healthy uh, from the research that you've done and, and from everything that you know that I don't know. You know, wh where to begin, Ryan, here? So what, are there a couple things, whether that's pitch counts or whether it's proper rest between or whether it's, you know, n uh, needing to have clean mechanics that, uh, you know, that, that won't stress the wrong parts of the body or, or whatever that may be, uh, or whether it's maybe pre- and post-throwing routines. Do you have a couple things that you think are some of the most important things, the most important aspects to keeping young young athletes, young pitchers healthy in today's game? Yes. So, you know, fatigue is the number one injury risk factor. Of all things, it's fatigue. You know, throwing, throwing while fatigue changes your mechanics, and it affects load. And so out of that, knowing that fatigue is the number one injury risk factor, we need to focus on uh, strength and strength deficits and imbalances. That, to me, is, is, is critical because as athletes continue to throw, um, weakness sets in, and when there's weakness, there there's a, this compensation. And when we change the way that we throw, it affects the tension on the muscles, you know. And you know, the one of the things that we're seeing in research is that athletes ages 15 to 19 are exploding with elbow injuries. So there, you know, we're reading about Tommy John surgeries at the professional level, but at the high school level, that's where we're seeing the most injury uh, presentations. So there's been like a 300% increase, I think, in this current decade. Um, and a lot of it is have, having to do with velocity enhancement programs. And, and I'm definitely for the use of weighted balls and, and uh, um, velocity enhancement training. But the problem that we have today is that we are not monitoring strength along with these programs. And in science, there has been a predictive uh, research article that's come out that shows that within a pitcher, whenever you have a mile per hour increase in velocity, you also experience one unit of load increase on the throwing arm, particularly the elbow. And so if you think like an athlete that increases their velocity by 10 miles an hour in a, in a year, potentially with, with some of these programs, it can be quite accelerated. They're going to have a 10 unit load, which we call newt meters as the units of, of torque on the elbow. That's going to increase. 
and that can expand the risk to the athlete. And so what we need to do is we need to increase strength along with these, these velocity changes so that we can handle these loads. And, um, you know, I, I think more of the research needs to point at this individualization of training. Um, coaches, there was a recent article that was put out by uh, a, a professor at Evansville University named Kyle Matzel. He's, he's a really smart dude. And uh, he, he had indicated that coaches are, are really looking to individualize their training, and more experienced coaches do that. Um, but there needs to be technology to drive it. You know, the, the common message for me is that, you know, I mentioned that strength uh, deficits are the, the most important. It, it oversees mechanics, especially when they get to a, an elite level. You know, most most athletes at an elite level have pretty good mechanics. That's what's got them drafted or they've been at the college level. Um, and so the issue becomes strength. You know, even if you have optimal mechanics, in my experience, I've seen a lot of players that have had great mechanics and also end up on the injury list. The ones that I've been in the draft room and scouts saying, you know, this guy's got a clean delivery, the ball comes out of the glove easily, the arm's on time, all, all these kinds of things. And yet we get the athlete and he ends up on the shelf. And the reason being is that strength had potentially reduced. And we started measuring this um, when I was at the Los Angeles Angels, that it doesn't matter what your mechanics are. If your strength can't withhold your throwing delivery, it's going to add extra stress to ligaments and tendons. So I know I was speaking, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of aspects um, about this, but I mean, the main take home is fatigue is the biggest injury risk factor. We need to work on getting our athletes as strong as possible and monitor our athletes continually so that we reduce these deficits and you know really give our athletes a better chance of not only performing healthier but throwing at higher velocities and maintaining them. So, Ryan, when you're talking about needing to get these athletes stronger, is that's obviously a very kind of a general uh, a, a general statement. Do you do you suggest uh, is there I guess is there one thing that's more important than another? Do you is it important for guys to really be strong in their lower half in their core? Is it is it important for guys to be strong? Uh, I know I, you hear a lot about throwing athletes needing to focus more on their back than like their chest or push muscles. You know, is there anything in particular or just kind of general overall strength needs to needs to increase as velocity increases to to uh, to be able to maintain health in pitchers? Yes. So overall strength is is critically important. You know, athletes need to be. I, I believe from the moment they start baseball, they need to be on some type of fitness plan. The body, you know, it's, it's a link segment that, that starts from the ground. You know, we're transferring force from the ground through all our joints. And if you have a weakness in the link, it's going to, it's going to create compensation. You know, it's going to add to fatigue. So you definitely need global strength. You know, when it comes to the throwing arm, we need to be able to create balance. And one of the areas we look at with armchair.com is the external rotation strength relative to the internal rotation strength. So external rotation strength is basically the strength you have in laying your arm back, okay? And internal rotation strength is the strength you have in accelerating your arm forward. And what happens is when this ratio, when we use a ratio of 0.85 to 105, so it means if the external rotators are, are less than 85% of your internal rotators, we need to really focus on the, the back of the shoulder in training you know vice versa if the external rotators are, are you know five percent or more above the internal rotators the accelerating muscles we need to start working on the accelerating muscles and what's interesting in baseball is that most of our injuries happen when the arm is laid back the slap tear such as a peel back mechanism your um your elbow valgus torque which increases stress in the medial elbow and can cause tommy john surgery you know, a lot of those injuries are occurring in the layback, you know, and where you have your ball release, that's where you're getting mo most of your, your uh, injuries at the back of the shoulder being your posterior rotator cuff. So all of these muscles have to be balanced in training. And, and one of the things that I think is critical, and I know, you know, we also represent crossover symmetry. It's our, it's our uh, flag, flagship uh, 
company for training is that athletes aren't gripping anymore doing training. And there's a concept called muscle irradiation. And what it means is that if I, if I activate an area of my body um, at high, high thresholds, other regions are also going to be active. And so, for example, there are a lot of bands and exercises I see that athletes are doing with an open hand. They're not gripping anything. So, you know, the forearm muscles, the flexor pronator mass muscles, those are muscles that overlay the ulnar collateral ligament, the one that gets repaid, repaired through Tommy John surgery. We need those really strong. So grip is important in exercise, but what's even more interesting is that gripping, um, and we have handles, you know, gripping the handles that are at least 50% or above your maximum grip force. It's going to activate your shoulder, your rotator cuff by more than 6%. So it means like you're getting a 6% greater activation every time that you grip like that. And I feel like athletes are leaving the training on the table where, you know, it, it should be some form of gripping while you're doing shoulder activities, you know, especially when we're doing them in forearm activities, is, is going to lead to an advancement of arm strength. So that's a really big take home in terms of, uh, you know, just training implements to use. The other thing that athletes need to do, and they may not know, is that the blood volume in pitchers actually goes down after games. So up to about 60 pitches, uh, the blood in a pitcher's arm increases, and then it starts to gradually decrease until at the one-hour mark post-game, the blood volume in the arm is actually less than the resting blood volume. And athletes need to do types of circulation work, um, whether it's perturbation. We use plyo care balls from our company to do rhythmic training with the plyo care ball. So it's this alternating contraction and relaxation to pump blood in and throughout the arm. You know, and athletes also need to do the right things nutritionally. If they don't have uh, vegetable-based nitrates in the body, in, in their body, they're not going to get the same amount of blood flow to their arms. So things like beetroot juice are really, you know, really good for uh, the throwing arm because it, it builds circulation. So it's things like that that, that need to go into a, a holistic program. There's so much to it. I know we're just we're, we're just touching the surface right now um, for nutrition, sleep, training, soft tissue work, um, but it all matters. It all matters to health and performance. I I can picture as you're going through all this stuff, Ryan. Just um, hopefully the people that are listening to this, their wheels are turning as well. As far as just you know things that can be done again to prevent injuries. Uh, and, and you've touched on quite a few of them already, and I'm sure that, you know, throughout this, think more things will come up. But let's talk for a minute just about crossover symmetry, you know, without necessarily making this uh, a commercial. But but I want to talk oh, I want to talk about it because you talked about internal and external rotators and how important, um, you know, different ratios are there and how important the strength is there as, as well as the strength of the overall your overall body. Um, and I want to talk about that as well, but, but I, I guess <laughs> some of these answers you're giving, I have three or four different directions that we could go, but I do want to talk a little bit about crossover symmetry for people that have no idea what that is, uh, or be, even people that have, but let's talk for people that have never heard of crossover symmetry. Can you just briefly touch on what crossover symmetry is and how it can help, uh, athletes to, to stay healthy and, and to, uh, get their arm, uh, you know, give their own what it needs before and, and after and during, you know, outings on the mound and just everything that crossover symmetry can do to, to, uh, to benefit the health of athletes, throwing athletes. Yeah. So, so crossover symmetry, as I mentioned, is the training tool for armcare.com and, and the armcare.com platform is what allows athletes to know where they have strength deficits or when they're fatigued. And so we provide the training tools um, that are evidence led by this data to, to train appropriately and crossover symmetry makes the bands. Um, and we have, we have multiple types. Um, obviously we have it for the shoulder and the scap and it comes with programs, um, that are, uh, basic, um, that we adapt from the armcarrier.com platform. Um, but we also have hip and core bands. So we're also looking at the, the functionality of the, uh, the pelvic stabilizers um, 
you know, basically your hip stabilization. And um, we also create uh, plyo care balls that, you know, athletes can use. So we have a very um, comprehensive set of equipment that athletes can utilize at the field. You know, the beauty of this this uh, equipment is it can be done anywhere. We have door straps. We have straps for attachments that go on squat racks. Um, they hook into uh, the, the chain link fence, you know, in the bullpen. So there should really be no excuse for athletes to miss out on a training session. You know, it's incredibly important that athletes are regular um, with their training and they're consistent. And, and now we, we have something that's portable. I mean, you can fit all of this in a bag, uh, in your ball bag. And, you, you know, you just go to, you know, the, the field and, you know, take, take your implements out and, and, uh, you know, do the work. And the same thing with our armcare.com platform and device. The device is called a dynamometer. And the dynamometer measures force. And inside of that dynamometer is an IMU that measures range of motion. So you really can take that anywhere you go. So you always have your assessment-led approach, um, and then you you have your training tools that go along with it. So it's very comprehensive for athletes in baseball. Ryan, is there a training? Um, are, are there instructions? I guess if you if you buy the bands, the crossover symmetry bands, is there some sort of instruction that comes with that to to tell? Uh, players and coaches how to use them how and when to use them properly yes most definitely um every set comes with uh, a guide so there's like a, a visualization to show you the exercises you know the direction of pull the positions you need to be in um, the sets and reps uh we also uh suggest different plans you know whether the athlete is is novice um towards being more uh, uh experienced so there's, you know, the, the loading of the bands, they can go as, as light as three pounds to as heavy as 40 pounds. Um, and we really look at the arm care training as, as not preventative, uh, you know, in, in nature, but it's, it's training. You know, our motto is that we want our arm care to look less like rehab and more like training. So we, we definitely want to match the, uh, the intensities in terms of the band resistance to the athlete's strength. And that's another reason why we utilize the armcare.com platform because now we know your exact strength uh, measurements and we can suggest the right equipment for you. This is pretty amazing. And this podcast is brought to you by Crossover Symmetry. If you want to build cannon arms that stay in top condition all year, check out armcare.com. Developed by Crossover Symmetry, armcare.com measures players' arm, arm strength and range of motion and delivers customized prep, strength and recovery training based off each player's wellness scores, strength needs, throwing workloads, and fatigue. It gives you the tools to keep your players at their peak all season. So check out the team packages and armcare.com and gain a competitive advantage in player development. Your players will be healthier, throw harder, and win when it counts. Uh, I'm really interested in the crossover symmetry stuff and, and, and everything else that armcare.com does, but there's, there just, there's so many things I wanna ask you about, Ryan. And I'm going to kind of steer away from that a little bit. Obviously, you can come back to it. But I just want to talk a little more about the state of arm care and what's happening in the game today. And uh, and I want to ask you specifically how much the focus on velocity at young ages is is a part of the problem of the arm injuries. Because you've already mentioned that as you gain velocity, you need to also gain strength or you're going to put too much stress in different parts of your arm and you're going to end up with an injury. So as you're developing velocity, you've got to develop strength. But you and I both know that in the youth baseball world, particularly in the world where, uh, you know, uh, facilities, training facilities are popping up everywhere. Everybody thinks that, that they're going to just, they're going to make a full-time living with this training facility and and they're going to put you on uh, some sort of a uh, some sort of a velocity program, and and they're going to guarantee you that you're going to gain this velocity. But uh, a lot of times it's just the it's just the arm strength program, it's just the velocity program, and there's not a strength program to go with that. And, and I don't know. I'm sure there are many places in the country that have velocity programs where whoever's running it is uh, is very qualified to do so. But I'm I'm equally sure that there are 
people running velocity programs around the country that are not qualified to do so because all they know is if I if we make X number of throws with these plyo balls or these weighted balls or whatever it may be, then then guys are going to gain velocity, but they don't know what is what needs to come with that. So I just want to ask you, the expert, how much the focus on velocity at youth levels, and, I, and I'll say youth meaning all the way through high school age, but really starting at younger ages, you see this stuff um, at very young ages with kids just to, about getting on velocity programs. I want to ask you how much the focus on velocity as opposed to focus on basic strength training or, or just you know, other parts of pitching besides just velocity, how much is the focus on velocity a part of the problem when it comes to uh, the sort of epidemic of arm injuries that you see in baseball today, especially at young ages? Yeah, I mean, with an increase in velocity, I know I said it, if, if it's not coming with an increase in strength, it's the kiss of death. You know, and I, I, I'm seeing a lot of programs out there that are highly focused on, on weighted ball training, and they're missing the other components. The body has to be incredibly strong, and I also believe the body has to be orthopedically mature. What I find very surprising is I'm watching athletes that are 11 years old, you know, performing running guns, throwing into a wall with no targets. So essentially, you got an athlete that young that has no goal-directed approach to throwing. In, in my opinion, any, every single throw has a purpose. And I think above all else, the athlete has to have command. What these athletes don't know is that even at the major league level, throwing hard doesn't make you an elite performer. It doesn't. You know, some of these guys that, um, that, that come into the, uh, the organizations that are one hit wonders, they have a plus fastball, they come into the organization, they don't succeed. You know, it might get you, it might get you uh, signed in college, it might get you drafted. But you have to be able to pitch. You have to be able to utilize different um, uh, pitches in your rep repertoire. And, um, I, I think we're getting away from pitching, and we're really focusing on just advancing velocity. And, um, you know, the other issue I have is that when the athletes are orthopedically mature, so they still have open growth points, um, the, the greatest time in our lives where we grow is between the ages of 12 and 16. Okay, and what's happening is that the bones are growing apart. Those growth plates are starting to expand apart. So if you imagine your tendons and ligaments are like the bridge and the land is sliding away, we're putting a heck of a lot of tension on the bridge. It's starting to have a lot more um, um, stress to it. And now you're adding the, the combination of throwing high velocity. We're probably creating a lot of maladaptations, things that we don't want to have happen. You know, then at the beginning, they're really asymptomatic, but they potentially become more of a problem as the athlete ages, and all of a sudden, you know, they get into college or they're in their first uh, years of pro ball and they're having surgeries. You know, we need to do a better job of screening athletes going into these programs. You know, one, if the athlete doesn't have the fundamental approach to the delivery, if there's problems with the delivery and they have problems with command, throwing harder is not going to make them better. We have to focus on, you know, ensuring that, you know, they are they're mechanically consistent in their in their deliveries. Um, you know, when we in pro ball, we realized that our, our velocity programs were only effective with athletes that had command, and some of them that could offset the fastballs. You know, a lot of those guys advanced. Um, some of the athletes we put in our velocity based programs that, you know, they didn't have those auxiliary pitches, they didn't have command, they threw hard. Um, they, they didn't get too far, you know, and the velocity program was their last resort when they came in. We had a lot of injuries from it because there was some training inconsistencies that they had coming in. We acquired a new athlete sometimes because they had a good breaking ball or a good change up. The fastball was low and we wanted to put them in this program right, right away. That was a big mistake. You know, these athletes, they needed at least eight weeks of training though. So we knew um, that the body was right. You know what? We had a lot of lower body injuries in our weighted ball training program, a lot of hamstring injuries because it's high speed, you're bracing. You know, it's like it, it's like you're bowling a cricket ball. And so there's a lot that goes into it, making these things successful. You know, if the athlete, you know, can't broad jump, you know, half their age. So if I'm 16 years old, I can't jump eight feet. I don't have a lot of lower leg power. You know, think about that. It should be intuitive. If you don't have leg power and leg strength, where do you think you're making up all that energy? It's gonna come from your arm. 
and, and, and to me, that is completely, you know, uh, the wrong the wrong approach to performance. We need to screen athletes to have the highest success in these programs. And uh, I know they, they make money, you know, and, and uh, like I said, I'm a proponent for it, but it's not the only tool. You know, when these young athletes are developing orthopedically, hey, get them stronger. You know, their, their increase in lean muscle mass is going to give them an advantage. You know, pitching is momentum. And momentum as a physics equation is mass times velocity. You know, if the athlete's a fast mover and you're adding mass to that athlete, naturally, they're going to increase in velocity. You know, the specialized throwing programs, we got to wait until these athletes are orthopedically mature. You know, and when I'm talking about our company with armchair.com, they can't go into these programs without being analyzed. You know, if you're going to throw an athlete out there on a day that their strength's down by 15% and they have a push day and they're going to be doing running guns and all this, uh, all the type of high velocity throwing with a weighted baseball, you're asking for a recipe for disaster. And so we can be better. My message is we can be better at implementing velocity-based programs. Those, those programs are not going anywhere. They are effective in increasing velocity, um, and that's been shown in research. But there's also been shown in research that they cause injuries. And the reason being is, is poor preparation. Athletes don't have a year of training age in the weight room and gaining strength. Um, just poor screening in general. So, you know, you know, that's my, my rant on velocity based programs and where we need to be. And the thing is, we have to stick to fundamentals. You know, when you see position players, think about it. An outfielder, you can't run 13 or 14 feet to then make a throw. That, that's not going to happen. You know, for every foot that you're taking to throw, I mean, the, the runner's going to get three feet. So I even see this with position players that are velocity based programs. They have to have very good fundamental mechanics. Um, to make this thing go. You said so much in that answer that is unbelievably important for people in youth baseball to hear. Um, I want to specifically ask you about the orthopedic maturity. How do you know? So, so first of all, I guess, let me say, you you believe that people that kids should wait to get on velocity specific programs until they are orthopedically mature. It's okay for them to have general strength programs before that, uh, but you think they should wait to have velocity specific programs until they've reached orthopedic maturity. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So what people don't know is that the inner elbow, if you touch the bump on the inside of your elbow, that's called the medial epicondyle. And that is one of the oldest bones in the body to be fully mature. And throwing athletes, it can take up, there, there's been studies to show that it can take up to 19 years old for that to be an actual fused bone. You know, but in typical, typically in a regular population, it's around 16 or 17 where it becomes fully formed and fused. So, the, so you know, that's something to be aware of. You know, uh, you know obviously, we, we got an elbow injury problem. And people don't understand it, you know, the elbow is very immature for a long time in our life. And so, you know, giving the age of 17 to begin these programs is a safety range. But, you know, we don't have – we're not capable of doing x-rays on all our athletes before they get into these programs because you're going to have some that throwing alone with all the traction and the, the tension, the tensile stress, is going to prolong – you know, that elbow from becoming fully mature, you know, the growth plates from being fully mature. So, you know, people have to know that. And, you know, this worry about strength and conditioning, you know, with kids, it, it's it's really, it's not true. You, you know, they're not going in there lifting maximal weights and straining. You know, if an athlete can lift between 8 reps and 12 reps in weight, they're in the right weight range for, uh, you know, the developing and, and people have to realize that injuries happen from acceleration primarily, you know, you're going to have way more throwing injuries and weight room injuries. I've been training thousands of athletes and I think in the weight room, I've had less than 20 injuries in my 14 year career, thousands of athletes and, and, you know, usually backs, nothing catastrophic, no broken bones, you know, just sore backs from the athlete was in the wrong position during the lift. And so, you know, when you add a ball and, and higher acceleration and more intense throwing training, 
you know, you, you have to be strong. You have to be. You need a year of training age. You need to be training. You need to have an arm care program. You need to have your imbalances remedied. You know, that's, that's, they're all essential. These are essential things, you know, for the, for the developing body. And like I said, you know, your 12 to 16 year olds, they're growing at an accelerated rate. And, uh, you know, that, that, that changes the orthopedic landscape for these athletes, you know, and we're, we're getting young kids that are throwing near 90 miles an hour and they're 14 years old. You know, that's, that's a lot. There's a ton of load on the arm. So we, we have to ensure that we protect them with training and we ensure that we screen right and uh, that our pro appropriate. If you're throwing at a throwing program like that and there's not a good training um, process around it, it's a recipe for disaster in my opinion. This is, uh, it's just so contrary to what you hear, um, especially, and I'm, I, I bring up social media a lot in these podcasts and I feel dirty doing it, but honestly, Ryan, it's like you, um, that, I mean, that's, that's where I think a lot of people get their information. You get a lot of information in, in baseball and everything else on social media. And a lot of times social media is, you kind of hear who yells the loudest and, uh, and, and you get accustomed to hearing certain things and you then you start believing certain things when sometimes a lot of times there's no real research to back that and what you're saying is just so contrary to a lot of the things that you hear how do you know when um a young person has reached orthopedic maturity and and is okay to start a velocity uh specific program is that something that your typical uh pediatrician can tell you is that something you need to to go get screened to figure out or how, how would if a family's listening to this and and they're really buying into what they're hearing from you how do they know when they're uh when their kid is ready for a velocity specific program based based on orthopedic maturity yeah for for me i, I like that age group of 17 when the athlete hits 17 years old we, we tend to be out of that peak high uh, velocity stage. You know, we're giving ourselves a little buffer. You know, usually it's like 16 years old. The athlete's growth starts slowing down um, for the majority of, of, of uh, young athletes. And so that 17-year-old, uh, you know, age mark is, is where we should be looking at. You know, this, is, this could be uh, – the opportunity to utilize these types of programs. But again, you know, the training age, like these athletes should be training once they start high school, you know, at least, at least, you know, I, I started training in the sixth grade. When you're, when you're talking that, training here, Ryan, sorry to interrupt you. When you're talking training, yeah, you're talking with, with weight training, okay. weight training. Yeah. You know, I started training at, with weights at, 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 in the sixth grade. And I realized very quickly that I was a very strong kid and I was bench pressing, you know, very close to my body weight for reps of six and seven. Um, and uh, I never had any issues. No, no, my, my height wasn't stunted. My growth wasn't stunted. But I had the necessary, um, you know, tissue resiliency, you know. And in those days, weighted ball training wasn't wasn't a big deal. I think I filled a tennis ball full of pennies and threw that um, for for my weighted ball training uh, with, a, with a catch and catch play. But I, I knew my body was physically prepared. You know, we have to prepare ourselves. It's it's the highest form of training. You know, biomechanically, you compare a pitch on a mound to a running gun with a ball. Use the same weight of the ball. You got more more load on the shoulder and elbow in the running gun than you do on the mound. So you got to think like every time you go out there and you do a velocity enhancement program, it's it's the highest form of training. And you need to be prepared for that. You know, you throw a, you throw a, a 35 pitch bullpen and you do a 35 throw uh, graded um, velocity day, you know, from all different ball weights. You know, one, it's highly variable. So we, we do need strength to handle all the variability and the variability can be good. Um, but that's where, you know, just, just sound practices. Give them a, give them a year of training. You know, at least a year of training, you know, so for 16 to 17 years old, they should be training for a year. They should be doing arm care work routinely. There should be no imbalances in their, in their rotator cuff strength. 
you know, their forearm strength should be at least 15% of their body weight. You know, these, these kinds of things, we have it all mapped out on, uh, on our website. We, we have, uh, you know, our velocity checklist and there's a lot of blogs. People will like the information out there that you can learn more about, you know, what we think is appropriate. And again, I'm not saying weighted ball training is, is not good. It's effective. Um, it might not be the right thing for everybody. Um, and there's a place and time for it. And, and, and that's, that's the essential piece. You know, there are, there are athletes that do not succeed on weighted ball programs. You know, that happens. And I do believe that's because they don't have the requisite strength. You know, some, some weighted ball programs have been shown not to increase shoulder strength. They increase range of motion. So you got to think your arms to catapult. You're basically pulling back on the catapult some more and you're getting a little more stretch short, but you're not gaining strength. So we need to evaluate strength during our program so we ensure that there's no inefficiencies. And as I said again, again, I, I'm going to readdress one, in, one mile per hour increase equals one unit of load on the elbow. You need to have at least one pound of strength increase on your shoulder. Or you got problems. You know, we're still doing the research to know what's the appropriate strength increase along with these velocity increases. We're going to get there. But you know, if you're, if you're gaining velocity and you're not gaining strength, you know, that's a big problem. This is this is really great. We only have a few minutes left. I have two quick questions to ask you, Ryan, before I let you go here. The first one is just about, uh, I mean, you've kind of mentioned just about when kids should start weight training. Um, and and it basically, it's okay to do that at, at almost almost any age. I, I think back, I think to my own kids and like friends now that uh, like their kids are in gymnastics and uh, you think about how strong those kids are and how they're able to handle their own body weight and and, um, you know, just how, how beneficial. So like that's in, to a point, it is strength training and, and they're doing that, you know, little kids, little kids, you know, six, seven years old that are, um, that are doing that sort of weight training. But anyway, what I want to ask you just about, about using bands like crossover symmetry or other bands, the other arm bands that kids can use at what age do you believe it's appropriate for kids, uh, that are playing baseball to start using some sort of band for their internal external rotation their their um and everything else everything else in the shoulder and arm to try to stay healthy at what age is it appropriate for kids to start using implements like that yeah so so they have to be able to be at a level where they can take instruction and and, and they they uh are able to follow cues you know until the age of, like I, I i train my nephews and my nephew one of them is seven he, he just turned eight so i started with him you know, utilizing the bands and, and, and teaching him very basic um, exercises from the, the the menu that we have um, with crossover symmetry. But I gave him like three or four to do and not 10 or 11 um, so that they can handle it. You know, and before that period, like these athletes need to be in gymnastics. I mean, my son's in gymnastics. I have two boys and they're young. And my, young my, my son's four years old. And my other one, he's approaching two and he's going to be in there. Like they, they need to just develop general body strength from the get-go. I was a gymnast gymnast until I was 13 years old. So I was playing baseball, doing gymnastics and playing basketball and volleyball. Those are my sports that they got to develop the, the global body strength. You know, there should always be a strengthening component. And you got to think too, like pick up your kid's backpack. You know, when I was a kid in the first grade, if you picked up my first grade, backpack with all my textbooks and things in it, you know, it was, it was probably half my body weight on my back or more. So, you know, the, the, even the handle of backpack, you, you need to have, you need to have a pretty good amount of strength because it can affect your posture. So, you know, I, I think by, you know, the first grade, you know, these athletes can take instruction, you know, they can be coached. Um, that they should be on some form of uh, a regular uh, regimen of training, you know, and what we provide is that you don't need a weight room for the, for the kids. You know, we have all these different implements that, you know, athletes can do a lot of body weight work as well, lunging, push-ups, you know, hollow holds, planking, you know, th there's lots of things that they can do um, to develop body strength without having to pay for a membership or a strength coach, but they need to do something. Last question I want to ask you, Ryan, is just with at armcare.com, 
what can what what am I going to find there if I go there? You you mentioned blogs, but you know what else? Are are there products for me to buy? Are there people for me to talk to? Are there um are, are there are there resources for coaches to help you know with their with the strength uh, or with the the health of their own team? I, I uh, just tell people what they're going to find when they go to armcare.com just as a starting point, if you could summarize. Yeah, lots of education. Um, we have a blog section that you can read about it. Our blogs also uh, contain our podcasts. So we have a lot of podcasts that we're putting out right now on, on various uh, topics, like some of the ones that we're talking about today in, in a little deeper detail. Um, yep, you can buy our products there. Uh, we have uh, you know all our kits and packages um, you can buy our crossover symmetry bands on the armcare.com website. Um, and uh, it, it's just, you know, we have a newsletter. So so I'm writing those newsletters uh, with a few people and ensuring that we give deep insights. Um, we have something called the Armcare IQs. And I'm posting a lot of these on LinkedIn. So, you know, come add me on LinkedIn. Come find me on LinkedIn, uh, Ryan Croton. And uh, you'll see we're posting them on LinkedIn. We're posting all these little mini lectures that I give. They're around, you know, five to ten minutes long um, on various topics. So, you know, we're, we are really big on education because we know the world needs this. And we know it's not well understood. So, you know, definitely I, I encourage the people who are listening to this podcast to go in and check things out. And they're going to be amazed. This is really great. This is Ryan Croton, everybody. He's the vice president of armcare.com. You heard his background at the beginning, all the other things he's done. And and Ryan, we've been really, really lucky to have you on this podcast. Uh, I hope it's not the last time that, that we hear from you. There's, there's, a, there's so much here that I believe really works well with Figured Out Baseball in our educational platform that we're trying to build. And, and of course, we like to bring on people that can give more specific instruction. You know, Figured Out Baseball is you know, for the most part, a free resource. And we try to give people the best that we can, but we also want to give people avenues on if, if they have the time and the money or, or the resources or whatever to kind of take something of their game to the next level, how they can learn and, and where they can learn from other people. And certainly armcare.com is one of those places that we're very, very happy to uh, to partner with in any way that we can. So Ryan, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a, a really great and very, very educational podcast. And again, I, I hope it's not the last we hear from you. No, I appreciate it. You know, I'm willing to come on anytime.